uh, we're going to continue our Bible study on marriage, and we're on uh, point 11 at this point. It's been a while since we've been talking about this, so hopefully you haven't forgotten everything. Ha! So let's begin with a word of prayer, as always, and then we'll jump right into the lesson. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you, God, for the day which you have provided. We thank you, Father, for our brothers and our sisters, life and life, everything, God, from your goodness. We especially pray that as we study, thy Holy Spirit will be with us, leading us, teaching us, guiding us about what relationship truly is, especially with you and with one another. I pray your blessing may remain upon those who are married and those who are not, those who are just thinking about having a relationship with other people, whether they're just friends or thinking about marriage. I pray, God, they may be consulting you, consulting your word. For you, God, are wise. You know all things. And you know who we should be spending our time with. Help us to spend more time with you, the Bible, and with your people. I pray and ask for that blessing. I pray and ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Yes. I'm not going to go over uh, the other points. You can go back and take a look at the other studies for that. We are Number 11. And number 11 says what? Remember, remember that, that criticism and nagging destroy love. Yeah, you got to remember that criticism and nagging destroy love. Because sometimes we forget that. And we jump straight into criticism and nagging. Now, there's a difference between criticism, nagging, and constructive, criticism. constructive <laughs> feedback, right? Because you got to deal with people in truth. You, you can't just bury things. You can't just hide things. That doesn't solve anything either. So there's a great difference between criticism, nagging, and actually a constructive conversation with somebody uh, to point out, hey, this is wrong. We should correct that, right? So let's take a look at this. Uh, Colossians 3.19. Let's take a look at your Bible, King James, for me, for those that are following along, King James. Colossians 3.19. I have a fan here, hopefully. It doesn't blow my pages around too much. Colossians 3.19, when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. I got witnesses. I have one person still printing pages. We'll wait a little bit longer. Colossians 3.19. And so it says this. It says, husbands, what? Love, love your wives. wives. Love your wives. And be not, and be not bitter, bitter against them. Bitterness will destroy uh, just like cancer. Bitterness will eat away in a marriage. It'll eat away the foundations. It'll eat away love. Um, bitterness is a very terrible root that you got to uproot out of your heart. And the only way to get rid of bitterness, you guys remember the Bible and it talked about the waters of Mara and Meribah? What like, had to be thrown into the waters? A stick. A stick. Not just a stick. It says a branch, a branch. that the Lord showed them. Because the branch is a symbol of Christ. And if Christ is thrown into the depth of the waters of the heart, it will out or uproot all bitterness. It will make the waters sweet again. So if you're finding that there's bitterness in the marriage, whether it's in your own life or in the life of another or just in the family or your general relationship, your coworkers, your friends, your schoolmates, whatever it is, Christ will solve that. you got to have Christ holy put in there will solve that bitterness. Take a look at Proverbs 21.19. And I've experienced this. I have experienced this. Proverbs 21.19. Oh, yes. What? Proverbs 21.19. When you get there, let me know my saying. Amen. 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 So I got a couple of witnesses, always in the mouth of two or three witnesses. We should everything established. So it says this. It says this. It says, it is better to dwell in the where? Wilderness. Wilderness, right? Out in nature, than with a contentious and an angry who? Woman. Woman. I've been around contentious and angry women, it seems like, a lot of my life. Um, you just want to flee. It. It corrodes the heart of a man when someone is like that. It's better to go to be in the wilderness, talk to God, get your head straight, to know how to respond to such a person. In fact, on the greater level, the greater level, because the church is like a woman, right? 
the body of Christ. It's like a woman. Where did the woman go to when she was being persecuted? She went to the wilderness, right? Because of an angry and contentious woman, Roman Catholicism, right? And also apostate Protestantism later on. The true people of God fled into the wilderness because that's where God was. God was in the wilderness. And so God will speak to you out in the wilderness. Don't try and sit there and fight and have an argument in front of everybody. It's a waste of time. Go, take a break, get your heart right with God, make sure that God is walking with you, that you're not the one that's the problem. And therefore, then you can come back later on and deal with someone who's angry and contentious. Because some people are just looking for a fight. They're not looking to back down. They're not looking to be humble. They're not looking for any of that. They're just looking for a fight. It's better to walk away from that. Don't step into it because that's what they want. So you have the personal relationship. Then you have the greater relationship with the church itself. So if anything, take a look at how the church fled to wilderness. You can find that in Revelation chapter 12 and then also in Daniel chapter 7 and a couple of other places in Scripture like Isaiah and Jeremiah and so on. Take a look at the next text. Take a look at Proverbs 27, 15. Proverbs 27, 15. And you don't have to wait for me to ask. When you get there, let me know by saying. Amen. 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 Got one witness? How about over here? Proverbs yeah. 27, 15. Good? Okay. It says, a continual dropping... In a very rainy day, and a very contentious woman are what? Alike. Alike. You ever heard of Chinese water torture? Oh. They call it Chinese water torture, but anybody can do it. It's just the way they have the name, where they strap you on a board, and what they do is they drop water in your head. Blink. 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 Eventually, it'll drill right into your head. Water will eat right through your skin. It's called Chinese water torture. And at first, you think, that's not torture. You just give it a week. It'll literally eat right through your head. So it says it's like a continual dropping in a very rainy day. It's very sad. It's depressing. It's um, a loud noise, you know, loud rain on a roof. There's a bunch of stuff that goes with it, right? It's not sunny. It's not bright. It's not very pleasant. So it says it's like a contentious, which is a warring woman. Again, you want to apply the personal and then to the greater level of the church. So if there's somebody that's just merely being contentious, be humble. Back off. Tell them that you need a break. Go pray. Take a minute to read God's word. Don't sit there and try and fight it out. Because somebody that's going to be angry and upset like that, they're not ready to listen. They really want to tell you something that's in their mind. Their mind is not open to hear what you have to say. They're busy letting it all out, like a dam that breaks, right? Because usually mm -hmm. something built, got built up in the mind or whatever, and it just comes flooding out like the dragon in Revelation and the dragon in other places. It says, out of his mouth came forth waters to drown the woman, right? So someone who's very angry and contentious is looking for a fight. They're looking to pour words upon you until you drown. They're not looking to hear anything you've got to say. So it's like that. And then same thing for the church. Again, applying it back to the church, Revelation chapter 12. Again, what did the dragon do? Try to destroy the woman through the mouth, through the waters. So it's better to flee to the wilderness. Take time. Again, pray. We're talking about criticism and nagging. Nagging is something which is continual. It's not like a one-time thing, right? It's where it's a continual thing. You know, it's almost like a little child. Mom, 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 mommy, mom, mom. Right? It's something like that where you're constantly hitting the person and they're not either ready to deal with it or they disagree with what's going on. So, nagging, a continual dropping, it's continually happening, it's flowing. Take a look also at Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. Again, how do you solve nagging? How do you solve it? Christ. 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 You consider his life. You consider how he responded to people. How did he respond to the angry Pharisees, that angry woman? Right? Because the Pharisees was part of his body. They were the church members, right? How did Jesus respond 
to Abram. You notice that Jesus was not in the city a lot of the time. It was only some of the time. He didn't want to be around the Pharisees a lot of the time because they were an angry, contentious woman in that sense. So Jesus would be found in the wilderness teaching those who will be teachable. Right? So take a look at, again at Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. Matthew 7, verse 3. I got one amen. Here's something also important to start with yourself. Make sure yourself is right. It says, and why beholdest thou the moat? You guys know what a moat is? A moat is a very tiny sliver. It's something that flitters through the air. It's, it's almost nothing, right? It's like a piece of dust. And why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye? Because your wife or your husband is your near brother, right? But considerest not the beam that is in thy own eye. What's a beam? It's a giant two by four, four by eight, right? It's a massive piece of wood. So you're worried about this little thing in this other person's eye, which leads to their mind, their heart, right? And you're so blind, you cannot see the giant thing that's in your own eye, your own mind, that's troubling you. Verse. Matthew 7, verse 3. Okay. So just take a look also, look at verse 4. How, how will you say to thy brother, let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, Right, that little thing. And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. He says, verse 5, thou hypocrite. Right? First cast out the beam out of thine own eye. Deal with your problem first internally. Is your heart right with Christ? Either it is or it isn't. A very simple way to deal with that is to go to prayer and we'll start reading the word of God. Read a psalm of David. Read something and say, am I right with you, God? Because you can't be right with your neighbor without being right with God first. So that's why the person is being called a hypocrite. You're trying to deal with another problem, and you got a bigger problem. You're trying to deal with that problem, and you got the same problem, but much worse. That's hypocrisy. So don't start there. You may notice that in the other person's eye, but then you better check yourself in the mirror and say, is my problem worse? Before I address their problem. He doesn't say you shouldn't address their problem. He says, just address your problem first. So it says, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. So he's never not saying to deal, not deal with the little problem that's that you see. Of course, by all means, deal with it. But deal with the giant that's in front of you first, which is self. All right, take a look at that. Take a look at also uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter 13, verse 4. And we should all know 1 Corinthians is the chapter of what? Love. Mm. It is the love or the charity chapter, right? The real charity, self-sacrificing. Love. Remember, charity does not mean a handout. Charity is self-sacrificing love of God. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Here's what it does. Got one amen? Amen, amen. I got an amen. Still turning pages, though? Okay, I got a verse 4. Good. It says charity, or love, right? Self-sacrificing love. Suffers what? Long. long. Like God is long-suffering, right? Because really God is love. He is the charity. And is what? Kind. Kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It means it doesn't lift itself up. It is not puffed up, swollen, and pride. Love is very humble. Love is very meek. Love is very understanding, love is patient, love is kind, love is good, love is all those things that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13 by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Because really, it is the character of the Holy Ghost that is being manifested, which is charity, love. Right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, charity. So the first thing you're asking for is for the Holy Ghost. Before you talk to the other person, ask for the Holy Ghost to give you the words to say or not say. Some things are better left unsaid, right? Because usually self jumps in there. So you got to ask your the God that you're praying to, right? Jehovah Elohim. you got to make sure you're praying to the right God, right? The one that you're praying to for the right words to say and also to hold me back from saying things I shouldn't say. Sometimes silence is golden. When you're having a conversation, you know that moment where the Holy Spirit checks you, you're about to say something, and then your mouth goes, Arr! right? You know those moments. The Holy Spirit basically just tugged on your shoulder and said, don't say that. If you say that, this is what's going to follow. 
So by having the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, love is patient and long suffering. You also got to give the other person a chance to speak. Don't just pour out upon that other person everything that you want to say. It's a give and take. It's relationship. They've got ears, right? They also have a mouth. If they've got ears, they can hear you. If they've got a mouth, that means they want to speak what's in their own mind too. So if you're willing to speak to somebody, you also got to be willing to listen to what they got to say. Not just pour out what you got to say. Conversation is a two-way street. Relationship is two-way. It's not a single road. You don't just go and demand of somebody else and say, you listen to me now, and then that's it, and you walk away. Give the other person a chance. And then be humble enough, even whether that person, what they're saying is right or wrong, just listen. Give them the opportunity to speak forth their complete thought. And then judge whether each of those individual thoughts are right or wrong according to the word of God. Right? Because there's a lot of thoughts coming out. If you can't bear it all, say, wait a minute, I need a minute, write it down. Or try and remember it for a later question that you might have. Conversation doesn't have to take place in five minutes. Conversation can sometimes take place in an hour. It might take place in five hours. Talk it out. It's better than going, right? Better than taking a knife and stabbing somebody. Like what some people do, like domestic violence. Some people get really angry and go and kill somebody. That's not the way to solve that argument. That's the selfish way to solve it. You didn't really solve anything. You just made worse problems for yourself by beating up that person, whether it's a male or female. Usually it's usually the female that gets beat up, but sometimes it's the other way around. And sometimes people get killed or murdered. In an argument, sometimes over just dinner, over the silliest things, they kill somebody over that kind of argument. It's because they didn't ask God for the wisdom and the knowledge of what they ought to do. So they figured this is the way to solve it. That is never the uh, way to solve it. So it says, stop criticizing. Now, while that sounds like a command, you really got to ask for the Holy Spirit to do that. You cannot do it of yourself. So I can't just say, hey, stop criticizing. It's easy. No, it's not easy. Because self will always want to criticize. Because self lifts itself up as God and the final arbiter and judge. Self will always say, I'm more righteous than thou. That's where criticism comes in. So criticism, stop criticizing, nagging, and what's called fault finding. Now, fault finding, it doesn't mean you can't acknowledge that somebody actually has something wrong, whether it's an action, word, or things like that, or even thinking. That's not what fault finding is talking about. Fault finding, according to scripture, is when they're looking for something evil when there is no evil there. You're looking to see whether evil is and there's no evil. Remember when the Pharisees came to Jesus and they were asking him all these questions about Sabbath keeping and all this stuff? What were they trying to do to him? They were fault finding. Jesus wasn't breaking Sabbath. Jesus wasn't doing anything wrong in healing the people. What were the Pharisees doing? Fault finding. They were looking for anything to blame Jesus for. That's what fault finding is in scripture. It doesn't mean that you can't address a problem in a marriage or a relationship, whether it's a local schoolmate, a coworker, anything. That's not what fault finding is talking about. Fault finding is literally you have an evil eye and you're trying to pin evil on them, even though there is none. You guys understand the difference? You can find several examples of that in scripture. Again, Jesus is probably the best example. The Pharisees were always trying to fault find with him. And if anybody didn't have any faults, it is Jesus. He says, I have kept my father's commandments. He says, which of you convinceth me of sin? Pilate said, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. Judas said, I betrayed the innocent blood. Right? So Jesus is the most innocent, faultless person there will ever be. As he would be. So you're going to find real faults in the other person. They're a human being. It's in a fallen world with fallen flesh. Everybody carries baggage, even though we try and should drop that bag. So if you do find an actual fault, a real problem, then come to them in humility and address it as a real person. Not in anger or bitterness, but just say, here's what I've noticed. Here's the pattern. Do you see the pattern? If they can't see it, try and help them to see that pattern or that word or whatever is whatever happening. Because some people don't even know that they cuss or swear. You know that? Some people, it comes right out of their mouth and they're not even paying attention to what they're saying. That's a real fault. You can address it with them when they cuss or swear. I don't mean take an oath. I mean the actual a curse word, right? Bad words, as we call them. Address that. But it could be on anything else, right? 
It says your husband or wife, and that could be also your relationship. This is not just marriage we're talking about. I'm talking about relationships in general. May lack much, but nagging won't help. Right? That just adds to the problem. You're only you're, you're throwing gasoline onto the fire. Can you imagine that? You go to a house that's on fire in a little area, and your solution is, hey, let's throw gasoline on it. That'll solve the problem. Well, what's going to happen to the fire? Ooh. Let's throw oil on it. Um, it's getting hotter, right? That doesn't solve the problem. You got to have something which is calm, cool, and soothing. You need the balm of Gilead to put out the fire. You need the rain of the Holy Ghost to put out the fire. It says, don't expect perfection. Um, I'm going to slightly disagree with this. What they mean by perfection is like robot perfection. But the perfection that the Bible always expects of us is love. You should always expect that. But if they don't measure up, help them along. Help them along. It says our bitterness will result. God expects perfection from us, and God is never bitter towards us. Does that make sense? So I want to make sure I put the words of this lesson in context. I disagree slightly with way, the way they phrased it. It says overlook faults in the sense that's true. But you should address them. And hunt for the good things. Yes. That's why when you're in marriage and in a relationship, you praise that person. I like how beautiful you are. I like the way you speak. I like the way you did your hair. I like the way you dress. I like the way, right? I like the way you help that person. Those are all the good things. And that's why you entered into a relationship with that person in the first place. But it doesn't mean that you, you can't ever address a fault. I mean, let's not be naive and let's not be ignorant. I mean, people are faulty. And if I have a fault, I'm telling you, I want to know. Come tell me, please. We've had conversations here in our own family and our own relationships here. It's healthy to do that. You have to do that. That's what means an adult is, right? Being an adult about it. Little children, they feel, we don't want to be that way. It says, don't try to reform, control, or compel your partner. Compel means to force. You can't force anyone to change. You can't even force someone to hear you. If they don't want to hear you, they're going to go, I can't hear you. Right? That's what kids do. Perfect example of this is when Stephen, in the New Testament, Acts chapter 7, was arraigned before the Sanhedrin. He gave them a long, loving message from God. What did they do? Nah, 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 nah. It says they plugged their ears or stopped their ears, which means they ceased from hearing. Gnashed their teeth. They're like, ah, I get you. And then they ran upon him. Those, per those people are not willing to listen. They're looking to kill you, <laughs> looking for the fight. It says, otherwise you'll destroy love. So don't try to compel or to make it happen. Pray for that other person. Pray for the other person. You don't even have to tell them that you're praying for them because sometimes that just eggs them on, right? Well, I'm praying for you. Like, oh, really? I'll show you. Just pray for them. Be kind to them. Be good. Be patient. Sometimes it takes a while for other people to respond to that love because love in this world is absolutely foreign and alien. It is not natural to our carnal hearts. It says only God can change people. Absolutely true. God is the one that's able to change the heart. You say here, but really it's here. Only God can do that. It takes the Holy Ghost. It says a sense of humor. And, and by the way, when it means sense of humor, it doesn't mean that you joke or you play pranks or you do these little mean tricks to one another. You should never do that with your spouse, your husband, wife, your children, uh, your coworkers. I did it one time to a coworker who I knew who was a brother in Christ. And as soon as I did it, I felt this absolute conviction of the Holy Ghost come upon me and say, Aaron, that was wrong. I immediately apologized to him for doing it. It wasn't nothing, you know, that would have killed him or anything like this. It was just something I thought, I thought at the moment was funny. The devil thought it was funny. He had no idea what was going on. But I felt absolutely terrible about it because of what I did to my brother. I loved him, and yet I did that to him. Nobody here in this house. Quite a lot of them. So don't play little tricks. It actually undergirds your relationship. It fights against it. It destroys the foundation. You think, eh, it's harmless. 
it, nothing is harmless. It's either working positively or it's working negatively. There's no Switzerland. There's no neutral. It's not like that trick was neutral. That little saying, that little, uh, uh, these things we say to one another. None of that's neutral. It's either of God or it's of the devil, period. So a sense of humor, yes. You know, be joyful. You can laugh at things. You know, kids run around, they fall down, you know, the ha-ha, you know. A cheerful heart. Kindness, patience, and affection. Right? That's love where it's really drawing outwardly, affecting. We'll banish what says two-thirds of your marriage problems. Yeah. Well, that'd be great to have two-thirds of your marriage problems just out the window. Mm. Right? Again, this also goes for just relationship. So try to make your spouse, husband, wife, or just your friend that you're talking about, happy rather than good. Because you can't make anybody good. Right? You can't chop off an arm and stick on a new arm and say, now I've made you better. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. Let me take out a piece of your mind. That's called a lobotomy. Right? People have actually done that. Take out pieces of mind and try to physically affect them. Did it help them or made them worse? Worse. Absolutely worse. Now they're like uh, drooling down their mouth. There's no personality there anymore. They're lobotomized. Please, do not try to lobotomize your spouse. And you can do that by a sharp word. You can cut them right across the head and they, where? they're now dead to you. Because of what you said to them or did to them, they're now dead to you and no longer listening to you, period. You lobotomize them to yourself. So happiness, really joyful, right? Be kind to them, be peaceful, take patience. The good will take care of itself, meaning God will work in that. The secret of a successful marriage or relationship lies not in having the right partner. I'm going to slightly disagree there. If God hasn't chosen your partner, then that means you've chosen somebody outside of God's will for you, and that's really the wrong partner. Now, God can be merciful in that relationship, but that still wasn't the right partner that God had for you. Does that make sense? If God doesn't choose for you, that means you've chosen or allowed somebody else to choose. If God doesn't choose, you've chosen something apart from his will, which would be the wrong thing. Like I said, God can be merciful. He can still bless. He can still work through that. But it wasn't the supreme thing that he had for you. So you should have the right partner. But if you don't, right, through bad choices, a decision, or whatever, being yourself the right partner. Does that make sense? That you yourself are in the rightness of Christ. Even if your other person isn't. Because some people are married when they find Christ, like when two people are, let's say, atheists, or, and by the way, it doesn't mean all atheists, you know, people are sad or depressed or anything like that. Just an example. You say Buddhists, you could say anybody. You say Christians, even. There are Christians that are married, absolutely miserable couples. <clears throat> because they didn't counsel with one another. They didn't really study God's word. They didn't pray and ask God in it. They just wanted what they wanted. Kind of like Samson. Samson did not ask for the right partner. He wanted what he wanted. He says, get her for me. Wrong thing to do. But Samson could have still made it work with God's blessing, and yet he apostatized himself. So don't do that. All right. Number 12. This is more like common sense, uh, even though it's kind of lost these days. It says what? Do not overdo in anything. Be temperate. And temperance is not moderation. Temperance is moderation within God's will. Because when people say moderation, they think, oh, I can drink a little bit of alcohol in moderation. No, you cannot. So temperance, according to the Bible, is not moderation. Temperance is holiness in moderation. Because some things are red light, period. Like murder, red light. There's no, not even a little bit of murder allowed, right? Alcohol, not allowed. Not allowed. Right? So some people think, well, I can smoke a little bit of, you know, drugs, whether it's meat or, or weed or meth or anything else, right? No, you cannot. That's bad. It affects the mind. It will affect your relationship. It will affect your lungs. It will affect a whole bunch of stuff. So temperance deals with the rule of moderation according to God's word. And even in those things which are green-lighted by God, God says sometimes those Green-lighted things are not always expedient. It means you shouldn't always do it in every case. 
there are some cases where you should even hold back on the thing which God allowed in another way. If you don't believe me, read Romans chapter 14. Paul says that there are some things that he was allowed in most situations, but because of his brother was stumbling mentally because of it, Paul would refuse to do it and make his brother sin. Therefore, even though Paul was technically allowed to do what he was talking about, he's like, because my brother would sin if I did it, it would, in his own mind, he's like, I'm not going to do it for their sake. So temperance is really a restriction in love. Moderation just says, yeah, go ahead and do everything in a little bit. That means if you really think that, that means you allow sin a little bit, right? God does not allow even the littlest, smallest bit of sin. Because if it did, he would kill you. The wages of sin, any amount, death. I don't care if it's 0.00001% sin in that thing. Still sin. All right. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 9.25. Let's take a look at some examples of this. 1 Corinthians 9.25. We got one amen. I need another amen. 1 Corinthians 9, 25. It says, and every man that striveth for the mastery, that's perfection, is temperate. It's not moderate. I, I cannot stand that the modern Bibles change that. They do that on purpose to allow sin because the man of sin is affecting most of the world, even Bible people. It says temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. He's talking about those that run races and uh, compete in games and things like that, like the Olympics, right? Those that run the Olympics are very temperate in what they allow into the body, right? Many of those runners are what they're called vegans, or they eat nothing but plant-based food. They know not to eat meat. They know not to drink alcohol. They know not to smoke meth and all that other stuff. Some have a little bit of confusion of steroids, but they know that to be temperate is how they're going to get the victory. So from the natural to the spiritual, how should the Christian life be? How should the marriage life be? The relationship life be? Again, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, right? That, that laurel of wreaths or whatever they put on their head. Or even if it's gold, it'll still corrupt. But we, what kind of crown are we looking for? Incorruptible. Incorruptible. One that doesn't perish. Something which is permanent and eternal. So you need temperance in everything. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because it says temperate in all things, mm. even the good things. For instance, did you know that if you drink enough water, it'll kill you? Nope. No. Water will kill you. I said if you drink too much water. If you drink too much. If you drink too much water, let me rephrase that. If you drink too much water, you will kill yourself. Water toxicity. You're going to drain all the salts out of your body and a bunch of other things. There's even one lady that died from a radio contest from drinking too much water. So water is generally good for you. It cleanses the body outside. It cleanses the body inwardly, right? Lubricates, cools down, does all that stuff. It's a heat regulator. But too much, you'll drown. Internally also. What happens if I get water in my lungs? You're dead. And I only, I only need like a teaspoon in my lungs, really. It's not a lot of water that you can drown in. So temperate in all things. So take a look at the next text. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5. We've already read some of this. Remember, still talking about charity here, because we have our amens. It says, charity doth not behave itself, what? Unseemly, which is rude. What else? It says, seeketh not her own which means it seeks the benefit of everyone else, right? The blessing of others is not easily provoked. That's the tough one because a lot of us are easily provoked because the devil knows he watches through his minions, right? The other fallen <laughs> angels, his minions, right? They record down when you get irked and they go, that's the button. Now, next time I'm not going to press that button lightly. I'm going to mash down that thing as hard as I can. And then all of a sudden, you go from this to, ah! And all it took was one thing. And the devil knew exactly where to hit you. You think that other human being was really the person behind that? The devil is looking to destroy relationships and marriages because it reflects the character of God. He hates that character because he doesn't have it. So he's not really after you. He's after God. And he's just been using you as a tool. You want to be used by the devil? 
Think about that. You're used by the devil to get to God. So it's not easily provoked. It doesn't mean that love can't be provoked. Because if you actually take a look at all the filthiness and the hurt that's going on in this world, do you know that love is provoked? It's provoked to a serious wrath of God. A true judgment. All the ch children that are abused and raped, the women that are hurt constantly, the men that are cowered down in fear because of men with guns, right? All the hurt and hate that goes on in this world, racism, right? That's a lot going on today. God sees all of that. So love can be provoked to an action, but it's slow to anger. So that's why it says not easily provoked. It doesn't say it's not provoked. It says, thinketh no evil. And this is where we fall short a lot of the times. We like to think evil of everybody but us. I mean, you might as well be fair. If you want to be balanced, you might as well think evil of everybody and yourself. Right? At least to be balanced about it. Not that you should do that. I'm thinking, if you're not going to be a hypocrite about it, you should at least consider yourself in that group of evil. You think evil about this person, evil about this person, why do you think evil about yourself? Don't you do the same things they do, just on different days or different ways? So it says, charity thinketh no evil. you got to ask yourself, how much evil does God think? Uh, Zero. So how much does he want us to think? Zero. Zero. God did not want Adam and Eve to, to know anything about evil. In the beginning, they were as gods, right? Those that have dominion, children of the Most High, that knew good. But once they took a bite of that fruit that God told them not to eat, then they had knowledge of evil. God never wanted any of them to have that knowledge because it's nothing but pain, and sorrow, and suffering, bitterness, right? God didn't want that for any of his children. Would you want that for your own children? So you don't want that in your marriage either. All right, take a look also at uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Go back a few pages. Okay. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Talking about temperance still. It says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, what? Do all to the glory of God. This again ties into temperance. Not only do you eat physically, you drink physically, you also take in things spiritually and mentally. Like the things you read, the things you watch, the things you listen to. It goes right into your temple. You guys don't know the sanctuary. Before you enter into the holy place, there's five pillars that held the curtain. And those five pillars represent your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth, taste, your touch, the five senses. you got to guard what comes into those things. Otherwise, you're letting uncleanness into the holy or clean place. So you got to guard that, not just physically what you take into your stomach and into your body. You should guard that because the old, the old adage, the old saying is true. You are what you eat. So if all you eat is pig, what are you? Pig. All right? If all you eat and consider is bitterness and murder and wrath and vengeance, what are you? You become those things that you watch, listen to, and all that stuff. So the more that you study God's word, which is all the pages of love, you become like that which you behold, that which you eat. That's why Jesus said that he was the bread of life. He wasn't talking about that you should bite down on his skin like he's a sandwich, right? He's talking about devouring and absorbing his words into your mind and heart. So even consider carefully what you eat and drink are put into your mind and also your body. There's a great passage in Romans on that. You take a look at that for yourself. So, eat or drink, do what, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. God's glory is talking about his character. If God wouldn't do it, don't do it. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 9, 27. First Corinthians 9, 27. Paul speaking, he says, but I keep under my body, meaning under reign, right? You, you, your mind, under subjection to God, is to have dominion over this. This and this and this and this is not to have dominion over this. God is to have dominion over you and you're to be submitted to God and everything else submitted underneath you. 
I have a whole sermon on this. It's called Dominion. You can look it up on my Facebook page. You can also look it up on Internet Archive. You can also look it up on BitChute. It's called Dominion for me. And as you consider the words dominion, Adam himself was given dominion by God first over himself in submission to God. Because Adam was made of earth. Adam was given dominion over all the earth. And your kingdom extends first from you. You're the first person in your kingdom. And everything else after that, like your wife, the children, the relationships that you have. If you don't have control of self first, submission to God, you don't have control over anything. Everyone else has control over you, including this or this or this. Everybody has at least those three things. So he keeps his body under. How? Why? And bring it into subjection, that is to Christ, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, like I'm telling you right now, when I share it with you, that I myself should be a castaway, meaning I became worthless. I didn't overcome. It doesn't mean that the message wasn't true that I preached. It's just I didn't really follow what I preached. I became the hypocrite. That's why you should never follow men. You should follow God, follow Christ. He's the overcomer, and he'll show you the example of the victory in any relationship. Didn't Jesus have the victory over that bitter and angry woman? Yeah, he won many back to himself. Many of those Pharisees that hated him, crucified him, and railed on him, and spit on him, a lot of them said, you know what? He was right. They chose to follow him because he did it his way. So you can win somebody back, even a bitter and angry, contentious person, through love. Self-sacrifice. Look past the mean and hurtful things that they say. Continue to pray. Continue to forgive. Take a look at uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.10. This is one of the, the problems that Paul had to deal with in a lot of the churches. First Corinthians 3.10, you guys there? Or excuse me, second, uh, second Thessalonians 3.10. 2 Thessalonians 3.10. It says, For even when we were with you, talking about the Corinthians, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. God is not looking for lazy persons. Relationship is a two-way street. If you're in a relationship where you're doing all the work, something is wrong. And you should address that with the other person, carefully, kindly, loving. It takes two. The Bible says you should be evenly yoked, not unevenly yoked. And if one person is yoked with another person, and one person is doing all the work, and another person isn't, it's a lot more burden and weight on that other person. You're stressing them out too much. The marriages and relationships take work. And I'm not talking about just, you know, a nine-to-five job here. That's not really what it's talking about. <clears throat> there are people going around in the church who are busybodies. All they would do is talk, 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 talk about everybody else and all the problems. Don't say you couldn't deal with those problems or acknowledge those problems. But that's all they would do. So they wouldn't actually work. They weren't trying to serve other people. They weren't witnessing for the gospel. All they were doing was gossip, backbiting, and everything else. So God says they shouldn't eat. They shouldn't partake of anything that I'm giving them. Don't be busy, buddy. Get to the real work, which is the salvation of soul, which is the uniting of people between God and man. That's the real work. And start in your own marriage. Start in your own relationships. Start with self. So get to work. There's a night coming when no man can work. The cause of probation is coming soon. Take a look at Hebrews 13, verse 4, and I know a lot of people don't like to talk about this, but I've had conversations on this um, that people bring up about the Virgin Mary. For the Roman Catholics out there, that I used to be Roman Catholic, and so if you guys need more study on that, I'll be glad to go over with you about Mary and relationship with Joseph. So take a look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. I got one amen. 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 Okay, good. It says, marriage is honorable in oh. all, and the bed, that's the marriage bed, what? Undefiled. Undefiled. We're talking, 
we're talking about sexual relationship between husband and wife, right? That belongs to the married. It does not belong to anybody who is not married. God is very clear from the beginning. Anything outside of marriage is either fornication or if it's within marriage with somebody else, that's adultery. Both of those are sin and error and you're literally destroying yourself and the other person and families and children and everything else. So the marriage bed is undefined. But that doesn't mean that everything that goes on in the marriage bed is sanctified by God. There's other things that married people practice in the marriage bed which God never sanctified. Like anal sex and everything else. You got to make sure that God approves of what's going on there. And I'm very clear. I, I don't have to, to beat around the bush on this stuff. People are so afraid to talk about this and yet they're doing it all over the place. So if they're doing it all over the place, then why are we afraid to talk about it as God's people? you got to point out the error that people are dealing with in marriages. Because people don't know. If you don't set the boundary according to God's word, then there is no boundary and they think anything goes. Like BDSM and sadomasochism, where people are actually torturing people for sexual pleasure. God would never approve of that. The marriage bit is about love and relationship, building one another up. I'm not trying to hurt and injure one another. That's a terrible distortion of marriage. And there's other things that go on, like tying and bondage and other things like this. I know everything there is to know about all of this stuff. It says, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will promise judge. Be careful that what's going on in the heart and the mind is not adultery. Remember that even the look to lust after means you're constantly com contemplating in the mind. That involves pornography. If you have an issue with pornography, even a little bit, seek God in prayer immediately and ask him to give you victory over it. Help him to give you sorrow over it because it is a distortion of his character and relationships. You will literally destroy yourself, male or female, it doesn't matter. Most people that are involved in porn, uh, porn and fornication like this, they're expending exorbitant amounts of energy from the body in minerals and everything else. We're talking adrenaline, we're talking uh, other types of hormones, gonadotropins, uh, zinc, a bunch of other stuff that goes on between male and female. And it drains the mind. It can actually drain your entire body to where your entire body becomes weak and sick and diseased. And you always wonder where all these STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, are coming from. You're weakening your own body. And pornography, even if you say, well, I'm not involving anybody else, it's just myself. That's the epitome of selfishness. You're looking at somebody else. They don't know that you're involved, right? That's voyeurism, first of all, which is also wrong because you're looking like David looked. David had voyeurism. He looked upon Bathsheba and continued to look. She didn't know he was watching. That's pornography. She was just trying to wash herself. David was like, I got a high position. I'm looking and nobody knows I'm watching. God knew. Pornography is one of the hardest things to break from. It is worse than some meth addiction because of what it does to the brain. There's whole studies online of what pornography will do to you. There's a whole lot more I want to say on that, but we'll save it for another time. Just because you're married does not give you the permission to watch pornography or to be involved in it. If you are involved in it, there's something wrong with the relationship. You should be entirely attention focused on the other person in that relationship, not watching somebody else do it on TV. And I don't mean film yourself and then watch it either. That's even worse. That's like Satan admiring himself in the mirror all the time. Self, self, self. Don't do that. Your focus is pleasing the other person, giving them joy, giving them happiness, right? Not about you and what you get out of it. Because some people have bodies. They're cut from the half down. They can't experience sexual pleasure in that way, but yet they're still a person. Some people are quadriplegic. Some people are paraplegic. Some people don't have the plumbing, as it were, to be able to experience some of those things. And yet, can't they be loved? Can't they experience relationship in the marriage bed? Sure they can. But if you're focused on pornography and you're focused on everybody else but that other person, that means they're missing out. You're not connecting where God wanted you to connect. 
all right, I'll, I'll say less about that now, and hopefully another day we'll do maybe maybe the entire thing on pornography, because it's bad, it's rampant, it's in the advertisements, it's all over the place. It's in your kids' schools. Uh, take a look at Romans chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. Amen. You guys there? Amen? Amen? We're waiting for one more amen at least. Romans, one more. Romans chapter uh, 6, verses 12 and 13. Amen. This is important. It says, let not sin therefore reign, rule, right? Be victorious. Where? Where? In your mortal body. Because this flesh is falling apart. It's dying. It's decaying. As soon as you're born, you're dying. In case you didn't know that. It says, what? That ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Those are here. You don't want your lust of your, of your mind or your stomach or your lower region to control you like that. You want God to control you. You should have victory over this, this, and this. Period. If you don't, ask Christ for the victory, and we'll give it to you. It's a gift. You can't earn it, you can't work for it, you just receive it and believe it. Then you work out your own salvation by believing God, and then you do what he says. What does it say in the next part? Neither yield ye your members. Right? That includes the sexual organs as well. Right? We're talking about breasts. We're talking about the penis. We're talking about the vagina. We're talking about whatever it is. Right? That are also members, not just your hands, your fingers, your feet, your toes. Right? It says, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness, right doing, doing the right thing with those members, unto God. Because remember, God is present. I know a lot of people think that's weird. God is present in the marriage. And that includes the marriage bed. God created all that. You think he doesn't know? You think God somehow steps outside? If he did, you got a problem. So that means God is not involved in that marriage bed situation. The devil will be there. The you think the devil doesn't care? The devil will force him way, his way into your bedroom. He's the rapist. Don't you get that? He's the one that loves the fornication and the pornography and all that stuff. He's definitely going to be there. So if God isn't in the bedroom, the devil will be. You need the stronger man to push the devil out and say, devil, you can't come past this door. This is the most holy place, and it's sacred. It's between them and God alone. Right? That's how sacred it should be. There's a whole terrible religion out there that talks about sacred sex. And what they do is they take it in a totally different extreme and ruin it. There ain't nothing sacred about what they're doing. Like tantric sex and all this other stuff. I give you a bunch of names for it because I know all of it. Don't ask me how I know. It's another story. <clears throat> Listen, I got, I got words you guys probably never even heard of. Some of you might have heard of it. If you do, I know what you're thinking. <clears throat> been there. I've been to the bottom. I've seen the occult at the worst. So, don't yield the members to unrighteousness. And by the way, husband and wife are members of the body of Christ. Don't abuse them either. That will leave out that whole BDSM and trying to torture one another for pleasure. Nonsense. That's not pleasure. That's trying to say that pain is pleasure. No, it isn't. That's called evil good and good evil, just as the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that happened in the last day. So, Overdoing, stepping outside of temperance. By the way, yes, you can have too much sex. I'm not kidding. According to the Bible, temperate in all things. There are times where you need to fast from one another and make sure that your relationship with God is right. Do you know that Joseph wouldn't even touch his wife, Mary, until after they agreed to come back together? Paul says you can separate yourself for a time to make sure that you're purifying your heart and your mind and your heart is right with God and with your wife or your husband. And then come back together. Don't stay apart too long unless you bring in temptation. And the devil will know exactly when that is. Be guard on that. Take it, take a week of fast. Take a month. It's up to you. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you that God says that you should fast and pray. And that includes in the marriage bed also. 
because you got to have a clear mind. When you're involved in sex and relationship, it affects the mind. There's a lot of pleasure centers, the pain in the brain immediately, and a lot of things that get released from the brain. You got to make sure. And by the way, one example of this. You go back to the Old Testament, Exodus 19, right before God gave them the Ten Commandments, His law and His word. God was going to speak to them personally. He told the Israelites, all of them, do not come at your wives for three days. You know what that means? Stay out of the marriage bed for three days. No sex, three days. I want your minds clear. I want your minds perfect when I give you my law so that you understand what I'm talking to you about. Because a mind that's affected with pleasure, like any drug, right? Because your mind uses those same chemicals. If you get too much of that going on, your mind becomes confused to the word of God, and then it affects your also relationship with one another. Fast and pray. And that's hard for a lot of people um, to understand. And again, I'm not going to give you a time frame or that. You figure that out between you and God, between you and your husband or wife. And if you're not married, stop doing it, period. You cut them off. You say, I'm following God. Cut them off until you're married. It says, so will underdoing. Work, love, rest, exercise, play. Look, adults have no idea how to play. Satan has gotten the adult world to work, 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 work until you buried in work. And I'm even talking to those in Christian ministries. The devil especially loves to lay tons of burden upon those in Christian ministry because they, he knows that they have a heart to labor. And so what he's going to do, he's going to try and burn them out as fast as he can. He says, oh, I see you want to work for God. Let me pour it on you. And he gives you so much work, you have no more time for God, no more time for your other relationships, and no more time for your own prayer life. And you end up burning yourself out. I know ministers, even Dwayne Lemon and others, that have experienced this. I have experienced this. I wasn't prepared for it. Nobody warned me of it, and I wasn't paying attention. Take the break. You got too much work? Tell somebody. Talk to them, relationship wise. Otherwise, you're killing yourself. The Bible says, Thou shalt not kill. Take some time to play. Be as little children, right? Spend some time. Take a drive. Go for a walk, right? Play with your children. Enter into their little activities. Enter into their imagination a little bit, you know, through God's Word. Worship, meals, social contract, contact, sorry, must be carefully balanced in your marriage. If you're spending more time with your coworkers than your husband or wife, there's a problem. Problem, guaranteed. A lot of this nine to five work was never in God's word to be that way. That's not how it should have been. That's why a lot of people have problems in marriage because what they do is the husband usually, not always, sometimes the other way around, will come home from work from a nine to five or sometimes it's a 10 hour, 12 hour work day, especially in the medical field, right guys? Right, 24 hours, which is illegal. <clears throat> They work you overtime, they'll pay. You know what I'm talking about, right, LBJ? Okay. Yeah. You are responsible for their help. God will hold you accountable for it. So take the time to get some rest. Make sure that the other person isn't stressed out, overworking. Because they'll come home, overworked, and the other person has all this other stuff that went on throughout the day, the whole day, like the children were messing around or something exploded, a relative came over and dumped a bunch of problems on you, right? You know, the, the car blew up and now you got to spend $5,000 on a car or whatever. And then you lay all that on the other person that just came home. Please, they got overworked the whole day. Give them a minute. Let them breathe for a minute. They just got home. All they want to do is just go, oh, I love to see the person I wanted to see all day long. Right? And then slowly break it to them that, hey, we might have to fix the car. Hey, my relative needs some help, you know. Right? See if the other person, you know, needs a hug, needs a kiss, needs to say, and I love you, right? You hear that. Might need food, right? Maybe they haven't had food all day for whatever reason. Their boss overworked them. So temperance. It says, overwork and the lack of sleep, especially in this day and age, proper food or exercise make a person critical, intolerant, and negative. Mm -hmm. Especially in this day and age. It is where, man. Everything's looked at with a fine tooth comb. You're on social media. Everybody's looking at you. They can even see pictures you post in the past. Like, oh, I saw her wearing that. I saw he did that. It was like 10 years ago. Being critical. If you do that, something in your marriage is going to snap. Something in your relationship will snap. 
It can't, like a ligament in your arm, your elbow, your knee, a ligament, right? It's, it's to stretch. It can give so much. It can stretch so far. But if I were to stretch my arm past this point and kept going, you know what will happen? It'll snap. It'll break. And it will be really, really painful. So take the natural to the spiritual. If you stretch that ligament in your relationship beyond the point at which you know it can stretch, it's going to snap. And then it's going to take that much extra long time for it to heal. And it's going to be hurting the whole time. You don't want that. So know your limits. Know the temperance. You know your marriage. You know your relationship with somebody else. You know how far you can go and say with somebody. Don't go beyond it. Take the time to consider that other person, how far they're willing to stretch. Also consider whether they had burdens that day. Because sometimes we are shorter or longer in our patience, depending upon what happened to us that day. Right? Sometimes we got a real short fuse. Sometimes a little longer. We got peace in our heart. We're just like, hey, it's a great day, and I don't care what anybody does to me. The next day, hard day at work, you're like, ah, don't say anything to me. Right? You've already, you, you were at your limit a long time ago. So, intolerant negative, constant overeating is a great evil that strengthens the lower nature and dulls the conscience. And that goes for eating and drinking, not just eating. Uh, a lot of that, what you put in your stomach, there's a direct connection between the stomach and the mind. There's a nerve that runs from the, your brain all the way down to your stomach. In case you guys don't know that, you can look it up. I forget the technical name for it. My, the Vegas, like, like, like Las Vegas. V-A-G-U-S, V-A-G-U-S, okay, nerve. Right? I knew there was an airport because I got my, my nurse friend here. So there's a nerve. Now think about that in your spiritual life. There's the same nerve between the two of you. And depending upon what you're eating and drinking spiritually throughout the day, mentally and physically, that's going to affect between each of you because you're connected together on both ends, a husband and a wife, whether it's a friend or a friend, a brother or a sister, or a parent or a child. There's a spiritual nerve that's connecting all of you. And if one person is affected, it begins to affect everybody else in the family relationship. All right? So, yes, constant overeating is a great evil. Definitely. The Bible says fast and pray. Make sure that you're not overdoing any of that stuff. It says sexual abuses. Watch. Just sexual activity in itself, if you're doing it too much, can destroy love for holy things and weaken vitality, your life force. Because you have an energy, a life force that God gives you. You have so much strength in your body. Some have more, some have less through DNA and through, you know, various other things that people eat, right? Like, for instance, give you a, a natural for instance. You can look at a super fast racing car. It's got like a V10 or a V12 or some rocketed engine in it, right? It can go really fast, really far. And then you look at, let's say, like an old Pinto, right? Or an old van or a bus, like a VW Bug. You might be able to get that thing up to 90. You might even be able to push that thing to 120, you know, if you soup it up a little bit. But that thing will never reach past that. People are different. So some people can go 300. Some people might be able to go 60. Each person is differently built. Each person has different DNA. Each person has different backgrounds, mentally, spiritually, and physically. you got to gauge that in your relationships, right? So when you're dealing with them, consider how fast, how far can this person go with you? Because they're not equal to you, usually. Some people are a little closer to one another than another. You might be, you know, 90 and that person is 75, right? That's a little closer than, let's say, 120 versus a 60. But that's how it is. So even sexual activity can destroy you too much. We talked about that already. Marriage gives no license to sexual excesses. Just because you agreed to handshake that I'm going to be with this person forever does not mean that you get to abuse that. I mean, think about that for anything else. Just because you agree someone to elect somebody into an office, does that mean they get to abuse that office? No. You're supposed to use that office appropriately. And you can talk about business. You can talk about school. You can talk about the church. Just because I elect somebody into a church office, let's say an elder or a deacon, I think that person's going to be right for that job, right, or any other office, it doesn't mean they have the right to exercise authority over everybody and start demanding like the Hitler, you know, but the Fuhrer. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Same thing in marriage. Don't be so excessively demanding. Tell the other person of your needs. Share with them the responsibility. Sometimes you may have to wait and be patient because that other person may not be ready for your needs. Right? Temperance. 
work it out. Talk with her. Some people are frustrated in marriage because, well, that my husband or my wife doesn't spend any time in bed with me. They don't sleep with me. They, they, they don't care for me. If you haven't tried talking to her already, one thing you should do, talk to God about it. Ask God in heaven for the solution. God give it the wisdom. God is the father of lies. God is the giver of every perfect gift. He knows the answer. So if I don't know the answer, and your counselor doesn't know the answer, and your partner doesn't know the answer, relationship, marriage, husband, wife, or friend, whatever, talk to God. He's longing that you talk to him anyway. Why not tell him the problem or the issue? You don't think he has an answer already? If you study your Bible, you know God has answers like 4,000 years in advance. Before you ever even born or think to ask it. You can think of like um, examples like Nehemiah when he was standing before the king. Thinking, Lord, what am I supposed to do about the building of Jerusalem? He just took a second to pray in front of the king. God already had an answer for him. Take the courage and the faith to trust and believe in your heavenly father who loves you very, very much. And wants, pardon me, to see your marriage or your relationship happy. Degrading, twisted, or intemperate sex acts, and I've discussed a little bit of this already, destroy love and respect one for another. If anything, you've got to recognize that the other person that you're in a relationship with is, is not yours. You didn't buy them. I don't care if you put them in slave trade. You don't own them. God hates that slavery anyway. God owns them. God purchased every last human being on this earth with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. That goes for every man, woman, child. I don't care what nationality. I don't care what shade of brown you are. It doesn't matter. That other person is Christ, God's even, father's property. You don't know that. You better be asking permission from your father in heaven what you're allowed to do with that other person. It is. If you abuse them, he's coming to you to hold you accountable for it. You've got a checklist. It's like, I saw that you slapped that person more hard than they deserve. I saw you curse at them. I saw you. Because God loves that person as much as he loves you. So why would we treat them the way that God is treating you and them? Love them too much. He said, well, God isn't correcting it now. God is long-suffering and is patient. He's longing that people will turn to the truth and recognize their evil ways. God's not wanting to destroy anyone. He's looking to save everyone. He's offered his son so that we can have that. But if you don't accept it, well, then you have chosen your faith. It's what you wanted. You didn't want to be connected to life. You didn't want to be connected to joy and love. Okay, God says, then that's what you get. Because God's not going to force you. God is not about rape. God is not about forcing anyone. And if a person, even someone who's married, says no, you better take stock that God registered that no in heaven. It's on his books. If you violate that no, he is coming in vengeance. You better ask for forgiveness. God will forgive you. And then you better ask God to clean you. If you don't do it again. All right. It says... A temperate sex life is recommended by the Bible. You can see that in 1 Corinthians 7, 3 to 7. Let's take a look at that really quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Amen. Verses 3 to 7. It says this. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. It means affectionate love. And likewise also the wife unto the husband. And likewise means it's equal. It's reciprocal. Love begets love. It's a rule of the Bible. Love always begets love. Evil begets evil. The wife, notice, hath not power of her own body. Why? Because she's joined into her husband. But the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body. Why? Because she's joined to the because he's joined to the wife. You are one flesh together, as the Bible says. Therefore, don't abuse the body and don't abuse the head. I don't sit there and start slapping myself in the face with my hand, which is part of my body. And I don't start biting my arm with my head. Why would you do that in marriage? Why would you do that in a relationship with somebody else? I mean, you know, treat each other kindly. If there's an injury, a cut, 
heal the cut. Put a soothing balm over it, right? Massage the body, massage the head, right? So it says, but the wife, verse five, defraud, which means do not deprive, defraud ye not one the other. It means don't withhold that which is necessary, which is really love, right? Because not everybody can commit a sexual act. Like I said, some people are impaired, some people have, but it doesn't mean you can't love them. Spend time with them, kiss, caress, hold, uh, talk, right? Build up, tell them how beautiful they are, how lovely they are, how kind they are, good, all that stuff, right? Praise them a little bit. It says, defraud you not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, like Joseph and Mary. They both consented, said, hey, I'm not going to be with you as so long as you're pregnant with this child. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have a relationship um, with your husband or your wife while the wife is pregnant. I'm not saying that. You just got to consider that for yourself. It says, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again. Because God loves that, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency, meaning you are way too long, right? So if you agree to separate from your husband and your wife, let's say, uh, let's say we're gonna fast from sex for a week, come back together at the end of the week and make it a special date, right? Spend the time. Don't just spend 30 minutes. Take the whole day. Take as much time as is needed to really re-solidify that marriage, recommit the vows unto death, in sickness, and in health. That's the time to be doing that. Don't let Satan tempt you. Say, well, just because I'm not getting any from my husband, and I'm not getting any from my wife, and I should go seek it somewhere else. And that could be pornography. It could be whatever other means, right? Some people just start, you know, fill it with food and other things. Don't do that. You don't get your comfort from food. There's no comfort food. Your, your comfort is in God and in the person God gave you. It says, but I speak this by permission and not by commandment. And yet, guess what? It's in the word of God. And the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So who inspired Paul to say it? Holy Ghost. So it's still advice, advice from the Holy Ghost. For I would that all men were even as I myself. Paul, at this point, was basically abstinent because of the situation. The situation was persecution. They were always on the run. Not a great time to be, you know, getting busy. When you're in persecution, it's time to fast and to pray to make sure that you're both together and in a safe place. So that's really Paul's context of this verse. But every, but he says, but every man hath his proper gift of God. And if you're married, he's not saying stop that. He's just saying that during the times of persecution, I wish people were as me. If you need to take stock of what time it is because there are times to do things and times not to do things like with, when you wake up in the morning it's time to get dressed it's time to eat breakfast it's not time to put on your sleeping clothes it's not time to then have dinner it's 7 a.m in the morning right it's either time to go to work or time to go to school or time to enter into study of god's word or whatever it is that you do in the morning it's likewise at nighttime so it's not always safe or the right time to be in sexual relationships Remember, temperance, sometimes including a stopping for a short period of time. But he says, but everyone has his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. And therefore, I'm not giving you a command when and when not to do that. That's between you and God. That's between the husband, the wife, and God in your relationship. <clears throat> and especially talking about the married couples here. Like I said, if you're not married, your command from God is stop. Period. No excuses. There's no if, and, or, but. You stop the sexual activity. That includes all the petting, all the kissing, for Tommy French kissing, even that too. All that stops. The Bible says it's good for a, a man not to touch a woman, especially if they're not her. Place God first. Trust him with that. And if God has another relationship for you, he'll bring the other person along. God's not greedy. He's not looking for you not to have joy. He just says, I want you to have joy in the proper way. Otherwise, it's dangerous any other way. All right. Social contract, con excuse me, contacts with others are absolutely essential. I mean, God made man a social being. He gave Adam in the garden a wife. He gave him a family. True happiness cannot be found in isolation. 
this entire system of monkery or the nunneries, not God's way. God never designed that. And that's why there's tremendous problems in all those monasteries and nunneries, right? The monastic system. They found it in the Reformation when they unveiled all that, opened the doors, and found out what was going on behind closed doors. And I know about what some of the stuff going on behind closed doors. I'm talking about in the nunneries where it's just women. Some of it's all cult and sexual. And some of it's very, very debasing. And you know what I'm talking about. And some for the men, same way. Some of it's homosexuality, but they're unwilling to admit that. God never designed you to be that. Free yourself from that system. God wanted you to have relationships. God wanted you to be in a social community, a greater body of the church. And if you're in a monastery where they don't even allow you to talk, that's a serious problem. Because God said he wanted your mouth and gave you a mouth to share the gospel. He never told anyone to be silenced like that. So we must learn to laugh and enjoy wholesome good times. To be overly serious is dangerous. That's why I try and I liven up a little bit. At least I try. Overdoing or underdoing in anything weakens the mind, body, conscience, and the ability to love and respect one another. Again, be temperate, even keel, as much as possible. I know there's you know shifts and balances, things like that. Do not, don't let intemperance wreck your marriage. Praise the Lord, right? Do we still have more time, or do you guys want to take a break? Because I don't want to rush. I'd rather have another study and take the time. You want to take a break? Take a break. All right. We're going to take a break. We're going to stop at point 13. I know we only covered two points. But like I said, I would rather cover it slowly, think about these things rather than rush over it. So we're going to close in prayer. You can think about what I've said. Um, if there's questions, you can contact me or ask God. First of all, he has all the answers anyway. Let's pray. Holy Father, heaven. I especially want to pray for all of the marriages and the relationships of those who are viewing, listening, and considering uh, their relationship in marriage or about marriage or the relationships, whether it's at school, work, just a friend, or in the church. I pray, God, they may ask you for wisdom and be seeking your face about the relationship, how we should deal with one another. Help us to love, God. Help us to give up the evil things and our selfish desires and carnal nature. Help us have that victory, God. Take your words by faith. That even right now we can have that victory just by calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You said all that would do that would be saved. Saved from our sin. I especially ask and pray, God, all those who are in pornography, whether it's adult pornography or child pornography or even worse, bestiality, things that are really out there that I know about, I pray and ask, God, that they would crowd into the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, that you would deliver them holy freely they would have no more desire for these things they would see how evil and wicked it is and how it is destroying them that satan has lied to them god help them out of pornography help them out of these things that the devil has trapped men in you know their minds but i know god that thy holy spirit is all powerful and you can grant them the victory you can grant them new desire i pray god they would truly believe your words that just by merely calling upon the name of the lord jesus christ asking for a repentant heart crying out in in tears and they would be saved. I pray for every marriage which is struggling on the rocks, or even those which are healthy. They would be seeking you in prayer right now. They would fall upon their knees and just trust you, believing you, that you can fix it. Though it looks like the whole thing is going to collapse, that everything is going to explode or implode and just fall to pieces. I know, God, you can raise the dead. I know, God, you can heal the blind. I know, God, you can heal the deaf. I know, God, that you can restore love where there was none. For those that have left their first love, I pray, God, that they would be seeking you in the fire of Jesus Christ in their own heart by the Holy Spirit. They would read your words, and their fire would be kindled anew, and that love would burn upon the earth, and it would be never put out, not be quenched by many waters. I ask and pray, God, that their marriages may be blessed, that their children and families be blessed. God, that they all may be saved together, find peace and happiness even today. I pray and ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. See you next time.